It's Safe for Internet Day 2021. My name is Jess Macbeth and for the next few minutes I'm going to talk about Safe for Internet Day in Scotland and shout out to some of our supporters. Firstly, here is the Minister for Children and Young People, Marie Todd, explaining why Safe for Internet Day is so important in Scotland. The Scottish Government is delighted to join countries in Europe and around the world to celebrate Safer Internet Day 2021. This year's theme explores truth and reliability in the digital environment, which is so important in our current circumstances when children and young people are spending more time online for learning and socialising. The internet, social media platforms and online gaming offer fantastic opportunities for learning, for empowerment and for communication. But we also know that there are fast evolving risks and challenges online. And that's why the Scottish Government continues to work with the UK Safer Internet Centre, police, education and other partners to promote and raise awareness of Safer Internet Day every year. Everyone in Scotland can join in raising awareness of online safety. And I encourage you to make use of the films, educational packs, advice, quizzes, all on, available on the UK Safer Internet Centre's web pages. I would encourage schools, businesses, charities, organisations, all to sign up as supporters of Safer Internet Day on the web pages too. I am equally delighted to say that in Scotland, we'll be celebrating Cyber Scotland Week from 22 to 28th February 21 to raise awareness of good cyber resilience practice and to showcase innovative work that's happening right across Scotland's cybersecurity industry. I hope you enjoy and find benefit in all of the online activities being hosted today by the UK Safer Internet Centre, the BBC and a host of other supporters. Thank you. As you might expect, there are schools all over the country, from Shetland to Dumfries, celebrating the day, and they haven't let lockdown stop them. Our education packs include videos and materials so that young people can learn from home. So here's a shout out to some of the schools supporting Safer Internet Day 2021. A huge thank you to Bannockburn Primary School, who in common with many schools are running a virtual assembly today. Clemiston Primary is also recording an assembly delivered by their young people to send out to parents and carers. Glasgow Academy is sending out digital footprint videos to their parents and Graham High School is tweeting out hints and tips throughout the week. Meldrum Academy Steps to Work learners are creating Instagram and Twitter posts and the S1s and 2s will be doing an online quiz. Port Ellen Primary are taking the opportunity to record a film and renew their digital pledges. And Torbane Primary School will be focusing on the online learning aspect of safety online as this is so relevant right now. The digital learning team at Education Scotland is sharing learning via the digilearn.scot blog and social media. But Safer Internet Day isn't just for schools. The National Fostering Agency Scotland are sharing resources with the young people their carers are working with. Heart of Midlothian FC have set activities and challenges to young people through their homeschooling support club. YouthLink Scotland are taking the opportunity to share their own online safety resources as well as the Safer Internet Day materials. Here are members of Young Scots Did You Know Steering Committee with their tips about online fraud. Hi, I'm Ewan, and my top tip about making sure you're not a victim to online fraud is to never give your passwords, PIN, or bank account numbers over emails or phone to anyone. Legitimate companies and banks will never ask you for these details by email or over the phone. Hi, I'm Callum, and my top tip is to never email private or financial information, even if you trust the recipient. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Hi, I'm Yule, and my top tip about making sure you're not a victim to online fraud is when you're outside your house and you're buying online, use the data provided by your own network provider and not public Wi-Fi. This is because some hotspots may not be secure as your mobile's Wi-Fi.
You don't have to work directly with young people to get involved in Safer Internet Day in Scotland. The Scottish Games Network are producing editorial outlining what video games companies in Scotland are doing to keep their players safe. SCVO are sharing messaging with staff as well as on social media. Encourage your staff who are parents, carers, grandparents, aunts and uncles, cousins to have important conversations with the children in their lives today. And we've seen this approach by several public protection committees from the islands to the borders where partners are cascading messaging to the public but also to employees. Police Scotland are promoting the day to their web ambassadors throughout the country. Let's hear from their cybercrime harm prevention team who have some ideas for everyone to consider today. I'm Sergeant Bev Bowles from the Cybercrime Harm Prevention Team. This Safer Internet Day, before you share a post, ask yourself how you might feel about it in the future. Hi, I'm Andy Law from the Cybercrime Harm Prevention Team. This Safer Internet Day, before you go online, ask yourself, what do my privacy settings on social media allow others to see? Hi, I'm Gavin Jarden from the Cybercrime Harm Prevention Team. This Safer Internet Day, ask yourself, am I setting a good example for my children when I go online. I'm Constable Mike Smith from the Cybercrime Harm Prevention Team. This Safer Internet Day, before you click on a link, ask yourself, do I trust this source? Hi, I'm Inspector Mark Gallagher of the Cybercrime Harm Prevention Team. For information on how to spot and speak out against harmful or misleading content online, please visit saferinternet.org. So there we have it. A gigantic thank you to everyone who is using the Safer Internet Day resources. And don't forget to please register as a supporter if you are using these resources because it helps us demonstrate reach and impact to funders. You can do this at www.saferinternet.org.uk. The theme for this year's Safer Internet Day is an internet we trust. In a moment I'll play a video explaining in more detail what misinformation is and how educators can approach it with young people. Before I do that, I'd like to let you know about other events coming up that you may be interested in. Firstly, for Cyber Scotland Week, check out our free live panel discussion on the topic misinformation and social media. Find out how to book at cyberscotlandweek.com. On the 12th of March, we're delivering another round of Online Safety Live, a free online briefing for professionals who work with children and young people in Scotland. Go to saferinternet.org.uk and you can register on the Training and Events tab. Finally, a quick mention of the Professionals Online Safety Helpline, who will be answering your queries at four o'clock on Facebook today. More details on that later. Now, let's talk about misinformation. I'm going to play a video that was created as part of our teacher training programme in Scotland. The programme is called Safe and Empowered and was funded by Education Scotland. Here is one of the videos, which is called Down the Rabbit Hole. We're going to look at the rise of misinformation, what it is, why it matters and what's being done about it. We're going to look at the art of persuasion, how technology plays a role in shaping our view of the world, and what educators can do to deliver effective media literacy education. But first, here's a question for you. Are smart people less likely to fall for fake news? Okay, so maybe you didn't fall for the obvious answer. It doesn't matter if you're smart or not. We're all at risk of being duped. But sometimes we talk about this topic as if you just need to be a bit smarter, a bit more on the board, a bit more research. We talk about conspiracy theories with a roll of the eye, as if only stupid people would fall for that crock. But it's not that simple. So what is fake news? OK, so that is an unhelpful term because it doesn't do what it says on the tin. Fake news suggests that something is either true or false. That's not the case. Think propaganda. The same event is reported in different ways in different countries. They might not lie, but they tell the story in a way that sheds the government or the people involved in a certain light. Or what about satire? Someone does a funny impression of a celebrity. Most people realise it's a joke, but some think it's real. Is that fake news? The final and probably the most important criticism of the term fake news is what people think it means. What started out as meaning something that is fake now means something I don't like or even something I wish wasn't true. I don't like that. It's fake news. So the term is not helpful when we're talking about trusted information. What terminology should we use? I'm going to describe three terms for you as set out by First Draft News. These are misinformation, disinformation and malinformation. Firstly, misinformation. That is information that is false but not intended to cause harm. An example of this would be a Facebook post which said that drinking a mixture of milk and cough syrup is poisonous. 
someone might share that post because they're trying to be helpful. It was actually shared over 5,000 times, but it isn't true. So misinformation is false information that is shared with no intention to cause harm. The second term is disinformation. This is also information that is false, but this time it is created or shared with the purpose of causing harm. Why? Well, it could be to make money. During lockdown, fraudsters adapted their approach to capitalise on coronavirus fears. For example, creating a clickbait email about the track and trace system, which actually installs ransomware. Disinformation can also be created for political reasons, like dissuading people from voting a certain way or dissuading them from voting at all. You might have heard of the term deepfake. This is usually used to describe a video of a person where someone else's face has been superimposed onto it, so it looks like someone is in the video who isn't actually in it. The technology has the potential for far-reaching consequences because it can make someone look like they did or said something they didn't do. But you don't even need to go to the trouble of creating a deep fake. We've already seen shallow fakes used for political gain. This is a simpler approach that doesn't need AI. You can use basic video editing software to slow down someone's speech to make it look like they're drunk or incapable. Or crop a small amount from a video and share it out of context to give the exact opposite impression of what happened. Okay, so we've talked about disinformation being used for a financial or a political gain. It can also be created for psychological or social reasons. This goes a bit deeper. Think of, for example, where scientific studies challenge the prevailing narrative. I'm talking about things like discovering the impact of smoking on our health or revealing the seriousness of the climate emergency. It's easy to accept the science if it has no impact on you. But if this knowledge threatens your livelihood or your way of life, if it clashes with strongly held personal or cultural values, you're naturally more susceptible to disinformation. There must be some other explanation because the truth would be just too difficult. Disinformation can also be a tool used within harmful personal relationships. If you can control what someone believes, you control what they do. The final term I'm going to tell you about is malinformation. This is actually genuine information, but it's been shared in order to cause harm. So this could be, for example, revealing personal information that would hurt someone's reputation, like the fact that they're having an affair, or that they did something that other people would disapprove of. Or sharing their home address or mobile phone number when you know they'll be targets of abuse. I've talked through some examples of disinformation and the harm that it could cause. It's important that we recognise just how significant the impact could be. I already mentioned that it can be used to dissuade people from voting, so there is a direct link to democracy in action. There's also a more fundamental impact. Is it more harmful to believe something that is false or to disbelieve something that is true? There are several things happening at once. It feels like we're experiencing a lot more false information online. Once you've been bitten a few times, you start to be less trusting overall. We're also experiencing what the World Health Organization calls an infodemic. There's just too much conflicting information. We are overloaded. A goal of disinformation agents is not necessarily to persuade people towards a particular viewpoint, but rather to polarise, to sow conflict and disagreement. And so it becomes more challenging to separate the wheat from the chaff. The natural conclusion to reach is, I can't trust anything. And this could take us to a place where we create our own truth we move away from trusted sources of information. The household does not kettle around the TV for the six o'clock news anymore. This is a place where that post that someone's uncle wrote who really knows what's going on is more trustworthy than the fake news media. Long accepted and matured structures and practices are challenged. Disinformation movements have been very good at marketing and promotion, whereas public bodies have not felt the need to justify their approach. They won that argument a long time ago but they now recognise that disinformation fills a void. So we're seeing, for example, action by the World Health Organisation and the UN encouraging countries to promote science-based public health information. As we teach the need to be critical of what we see online, there's a fine balance between being critical and being sceptical. What's the ultimate sceptic? The conspiracy theorist. When people are anxious, fearful for the future, where trust is eroding, a conspiracy movement can provide everything you need to feel in control again. Now, technology can play a key role in facilitating someone's path towards extremist thinking, and I'll explain more about that shortly. But the point I want to make here is that the impact on society of these extreme perspectives is potentially profound. There's a great quote that comes to mind, and I can't remember who said it. We can't save the planet if we don't all agree that it's on fire. 
who is more likely to share misinformation? Is it under 35s or over 65s? Well, research of American Facebook users found that over 65s are more likely to share false content. In fact, they're seven times more likely to share it than the younger age group. It was posited that maybe they haven't received essential media literacy training. They might be more susceptible to believing something just because it's been shared or liked by a lot of other people, for example. On the other hand, if we look at research by Ofcom and a US study of misinformation published by Harvard and partner universities, putting these bits of research together suggests that younger people are more likely than older people to come across misinformation relating to the pandemic, and they may be more likely to believe it. But there's also a suggestion that young people may feel more confident in their own ability to spot misinformation. We don't yet have a comprehensive picture of what's going on. Okay, so I know that you and I don't fall for misinformation, so why do other people? What is so persuasive about something that's just plain incorrect? We need to talk about evidence, facts, reasoning, making statements with absolute conviction, making a compelling argument, drawing you into the fold. It's the art of persuasion, but it starts with our subconscious. It turns out that humans don't treat every new piece of information they come across equally. For example, we're more likely to believe something if it's repeated. Simple repetition helps to lodge an idea in our mind. It starts to ring true. We're also more likely to consume, remember or act on certain types of information. Our brains want an easy life. We like stuff that's easy to process. We don't want to have to think too much. So we like pictures because it's easier to digest than written text. And images can also be incredibly powerful and have an immediate emotional impact. How a piece of information makes us feel is a predictor of what we'll do. We're more likely to read, watch, share and comment on content that provokes an emotional reaction. And if it leans into our own viewpoints or our own biases, all the better. Content that makes you think, I knew it. I never liked him. It hits all our buttons. And so we hit the share button. So our media literacy education needs to start with recognising these shortcuts that we use and how they can be manipulated. We need to build our emotional intelligence. It's putting some detail into the notion of think before you post. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? Why is that? Now, as I start talking about this, I want you not to think about a pink elephant. There is no elephant in here and it is definitely not pink. The reason I'm talking about pink elephants is that ideas are sticky. Once you see something, it's hard to unsee it. Once you've heard an idea, it's hard to unthink it. It turns out that the first time we hear an idea, it sticks in our minds. Now, this is a problem when it comes to misinformation. So let's say you heard an unusual home remedy to treat coronavirus. Even after hearing that it was a hoax, you're still more likely to remember the remedy. Over time, maybe you remember the remedy and forget that it's a hoax. So debunking is difficult because the original misinformation has stuck. What we need to do is pre-bunk. Pre-bunking means that we anticipate how we'll be targeted before it happens. We're protected in advance. It's like car insurance. The renewal date rolls around. Normally they add 5% or whatever. You don't think about it. This time you've decided to switch. Now, you know, you just know that the moment you cancel that policy, suddenly there'll be a miraculous deal on the table. They can beat all the competition after all. They can throw in some free home insurance or whatever. You just know they're going to do that. Now, when we look at misinformation, you just know any major event on the horizon, political, public health, there'll be stories about cover-ups, backhand deals, people having the wool pulled over their eyes. So look ahead. What disinformation can we expect in 2021? Pre-bunking. Helping pupils to prepare for how they will be targeted. And we can extend this to digital self-defense. Check out your settings on social media. What sort of personal data is being collected? And crucially, how are you being profiled? What do these companies think are your interests, your concerns? Do they think you've money to spend? On some platforms, you can change how they've categorised you and therefore how you'll be targeted. Next, let's look at some of those practical media literacy skills. So we might say to young people, look at the quality of information. And there's lots we can do here. Who wrote the article? How credible are they? Is the content up to date? Has something been taken out of context? That kind of thing. One of the practical skills that we need to develop is our ability to question the evidence. Someone's made an assertion. They've shown this graph. They've shared that jaw-dropping statistic. 
Research suggests that numeracy skills are important for spotting misinformation. These skills allow us to get under the skin of a false claim. If you can tell that the graph has been artificially skewed, or that they're comparing apples and oranges, if you can immediately question how on earth anyone could gather that statistic, if you can spot the clear flaw in an apparently compelling argument. These are core skills. To teach media literacy, we have to teach numeracy, logic and reasoning. So what is important to young people about misinformation? Do they care? Safer Internet Day 2021 is on the 9th of February and the theme is An Internet We Trust, Exploring Reliability in the Online World. We've conducted some research with young people about their experiences and perceptions around misinformation. And there are two important aspects, in my mind, that came out of the research. Firstly, for some young people, it's really important to be seen to be correct. You don't want to be the fool who shared the fake news. So you want to get your facts right. Secondly, some young people are taking on the role of debunking misinformation believed by family members. How do you effectively tackle someone else's false belief? Should we include this in media literacy education? I think so. Media literacy is not a one-dimensional thing. It's not just about seeing a piece of information and deciding whether you believe it or not. It's a social problem. When people are drawn into false conspiracy theories, it's not just about the issue itself, the topic we're centred on. It's about identity, belonging, friendship, social hierarchies, shared values. This is why throwing facts at the problem doesn't help. If I accept this fact, it would go against everything I stand for. I would lose my identity, my friendships, my social standing. So I cannot accept that fact. Quite often people who have been drawn into false conspiracies have actually done an incredible amount of research and analytical thinking. And a topic of disinformation may include some truth at the centre, but all their research and thinking has been clouded by other motivations. You can always talk your way back to the lie. Remember that conspiracy theories cannot be debunked. He's just saying that because he's been put under pressure. We all know the real truth. So we need to take the practical tasks, like fact-checking, and marry them with the social skills. For example, empathising with someone about how difficult and intractable an issue seems to be, understanding their values and motivations, and then looking to engage in conversation where you're both bought in to finding a solution. Contrast that approach with telling someone they're a moron for believing such a load of rubbish, which results in them entrenched in their position, and they'll listen to nothing you say. Also think about helping kids to differentiate between liking and trusting. I may like this person, but it does not mean I implicitly trust everything they say. Gut instinct and all that. What is the role of technology in all this? I used to think that technology was neutral, that bad behaviour online was about behaviour and people needed to do better. And people do need to do better. But technology isn't neutral. Let's run through how technology design influences what we think and do. Joe Edelman has some really interesting insights into how technology conflicts with personal values. He says, for example, that if one of your personal values is honesty, living with integrity, speaking the truth, well, it's difficult to be honest on Instagram if honest posts get fewer likes. The platform prioritises popularity above honesty. Similarly, if you value courage, well, a courageous statement on Twitter could lead to harassment. Better not. He calls this issue the cost of values misaligned systems. It's the design, the way the technology works, that means we can't live according to our values when we're online. You've probably heard the phrase time well spent, which was coined by Joe Edelman in conversation with Tristan Harry. It references the design of social media, gaming and other online services which purposely keep you engaged on screen. There is a reason why we disappear into our screens for longer than we thought. So picture this, it's 11 o'clock at night, school night. You've just watched episode four of The Crown. The programme finishes, and while you're scrabbling around for the remote to switch it off, on screen, the credits are minimised. A little counter is shown. Five, four, three, two. Before you know it, the next episode is playing. Oh, let's just watch another one. Well, you've been played. Autoplays kept you on screen. Or just think of notifications. As Tristan Harris says, they schedule a little thought in your brain. You have no control over that. The notification pings. Now you know it's your friend's birthday today. It's done. You're not in control and this drive for attention extends to content as well. Companies prioritise content that people engage with. And that's not the boring stuff. It's the outrageous, clickbaity, angry or painful stuff. Bad news travels faster than good. 
And so news feeds and recommendation algorithms feed us a diet of the bad stuff, the misinformation and the disinformation, because we're more likely to read, watch, like, comment on or share it. Unfortunately, there's a synergy combining these features. It leads to extreme perspectives. The crux of this is the recommendation algorithm. On many sites, you'll see recommendations for content. Other people who bought this book also bought, that's an example. Other people who like that particular series you just watched also like this one. And on video platforms such as YouTube, you'll see a list of recommended videos that you may wish to watch after this one. The problem is how the system decides what to recommend. I haven't got time here to go into all the detail, but the system is trying to find information that is relevant to your interests, but also content that you are more likely to watch, comment on, share, etc. If you leave autoplay running and allow the system to recommend one video after another to you, it'll become increasingly extreme because it needs to up the ante every time, give you the same kind of content, but even more engaging. More engaging tends to be more enraging or perhaps more conspiratorial. It's a significant factor in movements such as Flat Earth and anti-vax. Platforms are actually doing a significant amount of work to remove misinformation and disinformation, to stop it being shared, or to flag it so that the user can make up their own mind. There is a science behind deciding whether to flag a piece of misinformation, or whether by doing so you are drawing more attention towards it. It's not easy. Companies say they're working well to reduce recommendations towards inappropriate content, but it's a common criticism levelled at these companies just now. Is it okay to host this material as long as you don't actively promote it to others? In any event, the problem remains until they change the system which provides content in exchange for your eyeballs. And in the meantime, we teach media literacy. Okay, so we've talked through various different aspects of misinformation, what it is, why it's an urgent issue, how technology facilitates it and why we fall for it. I've referenced some different messages to use in education. Now let's quickly go through some of the available resources. Starting with Project Evolve. That's projectevolve.co.uk. This is a suite of free educational resources designed in support of the Education for Connected World framework. It's a library of content split into eight strands, one of which is managing online information. This is where you'll find lesson plans and resources for pupils from early years up to age 18. For example, in the Tech Talk and Truth Early Years resource, children follow a dialogue which questions whether a smart speaker always has the answer. In the All That Glistens resource, primary school aged children look at examples of misinformation and consider what critical thinking means. In Echo Echo, secondary school students can consider how social media can amplify certain views or extreme ideas. And in Digital Deception Self-Defense, pupils learn how to protect themselves from disinformation. Also, if you work with secondary or college age students, you might suggest the first draft course called Protection from Deception. It's a text-based course where you receive a text a day for two weeks. It's where I learned about pre-bunking. I already mentioned that Safer Internet Day 2021 is focusing on the theme of trust on the internet. We are creating education packs for pupils or parents. Also, take a look at the National Literacy Trust materials on misinformation, and you might want to try spotthetroll.org yourself for a quiz on fake social media accounts. Our time is nearly up. Thank you to everyone who's been involved in Safer Internet Day across Scotland. This year's theme and internet we trust is so important to modern life. Our free resources are available on our website, saferinternet.org.uk, to use throughout the year. In the video, I also mentioned Project Evolve. Here is a quick explainer about all the free educational resources included in Project Evolve.
Next up in our programme of events today is the Professionals Online Safety Helpline. At four o'clock, the helpline will go live on the UK Safer Internet Centre Facebook page, answering your queries about online safety issues affecting a young person, yourself or your organisation. If you work with children and young people, this opportunity is not to be missed. Thanks again and happy Safer Internet Day.